So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the, in your book it's called a problem solving process, and I want to talk about it, make sure you're comfortable with it, because there are several questions on the test about this, but also kind of get you to think about it in a slightly different way, because I think when most people see problem, I, I, I have a lot of students when I used to ask a question like this on our group projects, they would go, well, we didn't use it because we didn't have a problem. And I'm going to try to get you to think about this as not a problem solving process, but as a project management process. So uh, you guys, most of you know my background is in strategic communications. And that really involved a lot of projects and planning and strategic planning. And we used a system very much like this one that you see in your textbook it, it, a little bit more complex, but it is extremely useful. And a lot of times when I'm approaching problems or projects, um, developing a new course, or even in my own personal life, getting ready to like, you know, do a big DIY project, a lot of times I find myself kind of going back to this process over and over and over. And it, so it's an excellent system when you are doing any type of large project with a lot of moving pieces, and especially when you have a ton of different people. And I think that that's why it's included here in this group section. Um, and I just, so I just want you to think about it as a problem per se. I want you to think about it more as a, as a, as a process that is really good in general for approaching a large project, especially a group project. So the first step is that formation step. And I think that if you look at the Tuckman model that was described in the previous slide and that's in your book, that forming, storming, norming, performing, yada, 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 that that really talks a lot about formation. How do you get your group together? How do you get them excited? How do you find out what their strengths and weaknesses are? And the only thing that I have to add to that is that you... When you're doing a group project, especially for classes, and that's where a lot of people I, I know struggle, in when you're doing that, a lot of people, they just jump right to, okay, let's look at the assignment. I think it's good, even if it's only a 10 minute conversation, to sit back and actually talk to your people and say, okay, what do we wanna see out of this? You know, um, what, are, what are the classes are you guys taking? What's your workload? Um, because honestly, some people might look at, you know, look at a project and say, you know, I'm really busy. A C is fine. Um, and other people will go, no, I have to get an A on everything. And if you've got those two people and you don't address that right ahead, right away, you're going to get a conflict. So it's always good to kind of put cards on the table before you even get started. And then you'll find it's better, um, in the long run. Same thing with trying to figure out, you know, what are people's strengths? Where should they go? What are the things that people can do? And um, I think that that will help. And that's what they mean by the emergence. And it's also good, I think, to really like put the norms on the table. What are the expectations? You know, what are the expectations for this? And I think the more explicit you are, excuse me, um, the more explicit you are at the beginning, the less issues you'll run into in the long, in the long run, you know. Um, so that's that piece, excuse me. Then you have to go into what they call in the book problem identification. But really what you're doing is, is defining your objective. You're trying to figure out what is the task that we have to accomplish. And normally that is, you know, kind of looking at what, you know, making sure everybody understands the assignment if you're doing an assignment. Um, let's pretend like you're in a club or an organization for school and you, you want to send everybody to a conference. Well, Kitty, you can't run around the microphone. No, go away. Shoo, shoo. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, so you want to send everybody to a conference. That, you know, so you might say, okay, well, what's the cost of the conference? What can people afford? And then you say, okay, how much do we have to raise? That would be the also part of the problem identification or uh, the problem identification. Then you're going to analyze the problem. That's the next step. Problem analysis is, you know, he doesn't do this until I start recording videos. He really doesn't. He, he's just kind of, he really likes videos. Um, so then you're going to do, pro, you know, analyzing the problem. 
And when you analyze the problem, what you're really looking for is what are the goalposts in the, you know, what are the criteria? And that's what leads to that next, that next set that says identify criteria. When you're analyzing your problem, you're pulling out the pieces. You know, you're pulling out, okay, what do we absolutely have to have? What is the rubric for grading the project? You know, how many sources do we need? Or in the case of like a fundraiser, you know, how much money do we have to make? What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? What are the rules? You know, because eventually the goal is to come up with a list of criteria that kind of defines the outside edges of whatever project you're working on. So if you're working on a group presentation, how many minutes does it have to be? What are the topic ranges? Um, what are the source requirements, like I just said? And if it's a more like an event plan, what's our budget? You know, what do we want the theme to be? What are we allowed to do? Um, if you're doing that fundraiser I just mentioned, you know, what are some of the things that you are able to work on? You know, what, you know, uh, on our campus, you can only have a certain kinds of food type fundraisers, if that makes any sense. So that would go into your criteria. So you get a list of all of the, all of the kind of the limiting factors. And guys, this is so, so important. Do not skip this step. So important because the next step is what they call solution generation. And what's really interesting with solution generation is that we have forever um, really talked about the value of what we call brainstorming. Now, if you've been in any group, you have done brainstorming. This is where they're like, you know, throw out your ideas. There's no bad ideas. We're going to write them all up on the board. The problem is, is that there are bad ideas. You know, if you want to do a fundraiser and you're going to give away a fun jet vacation, well, maybe that's not permissible, or maybe there's no way you can get a fun jet vacation to give away. You know, all of those, you know, so it's really important to analyze that problem and identify the criteria so that when you take your people to start coming up with solutions, they're doing so in the right sandbox, right? They're not doing sky's the limit stuff. They're thinking really about the criteria when they're coming up with ideas. We also have new research in the field of organizational psychology and in organizational communications that says that brainstorming is not the end all be all awesome of solution generation that we thought it was. I would say for probably a good 20 years, brainstorming was the buzzword that you got in every single organization. People go, let's brainstorm. And I will tell you, I hated it. But what we're finding is the problem with brainstorming is that so many people, what you have is the two or three people who are super comfortable with that tend to rise up and start giving out all the ideas and you really shut down people who are more introverted or people who just don't like that throw out process. Um, there are other ways. There's one thing called think storming, which is actually pretty cool. You put on some music and you give people the opportunity to just kind of generate ideas. Um, there's think, pair, share, where you think about it you write some stuff down, then you turn to one person and you vet those ideas based on the criteria and then you pick two or three and then that's what you share. Um, I'm a big fan of telling people ahead of time. You know, so you do in meeting one, let's assume that this is a group project, you would do your formation, your problem identification and your problem analysis. And then th you say, by the time we come back, everybody come with five ideas and we'll we'll go through them and then you put people in small groups you vet those ideas down to two per group and then you share those ideas so then you only have like six ideas to go through the thing that the nice thing about that is that the people who are hardcore into brainstorming aren't going to remember to do it anyway and they're going to do it on the fly so it, it 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 doesn't hurt anybody's process which is kind of cool so uh, but however you choose to do it that's where you come up with all of your ideas hopefully keeping the problem analysis and criteria in mind. Then what you do is you go through those ideas systematically and you say, okay, based on our criteria, are there any of these we can eliminate? And then you leave them and start thinking about how you're gonna make your decision if you come down to two or three. The cool thing about focusing on that criteria, and you hear me, I'm really kind of almost beating a horse at this point, is when you, it keeps the, it keeps it from being personal. 
because sometimes what'll happen in groups is that you will say, you know, hey, this idea won't work because of this. And someone who's really, really uh, emotionally invested in that idea, they think their idea is the best idea. They think that the group doesn't like them because they don't like their idea. And I think it's important to stick to those criteria when you're figuring out why an idea won't work, okay? And um, that's gonna help keep that from getting personal and keep people from getting upset that their idea was discarded, okay? Once you actually have your idea, what you're gonna do, then what you do is you break, that is the point. See, now we're already like two meetings in. That's the place, all the way down here, where you start to kind of break this up into almost like a to-do list and you start assigning out. You start saying, okay, by the next time we meet, Cindy, you're gonna have this done, Bob, you're gonna have this done, Trey, you're gonna have this done. And then you say, okay, that's what we're gonna have done. By the way, it's important to say, you do this, you do that, you do this, or have people volunteer for key pieces. Um, and if you don't, then everyone will think it was someone else's job to get it done. Then you follow up with the, at the next meeting or through email um, with your piece. So, and then that's how the project gets done. And it's amazing how well this works. And it's amazing how often people don't do it. So I hope that this is a helpful thing, not just for the test, but for when you have your next group project and you have to do something kind of like this. All right. See you in the next video. Take care.